World War II has already started. There is conflict in Europe, but outside of Europe, in Asia, there is conflict. Japan is invading China, and Emperor Hirohito wants to ensure that his plans do not get scuppered by interference. After the third of four imperial conferences, you are Emperor Hirohito, and you are considering the matter. You have not yet given authorization for a intervention in order to ensure what your generals think is the route to success. You've been told that if you attack proactively, you can ensure success in the Pacific by disabling US forces whilst they have not yet entered the war. Well, I don't know what you would do in that situation, but we know what Emperor Hirohito did, that he approved an attack. And it started with Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, 1941. What do you think of that? Well, to quote uh, President Roosevelt, not long after the attack, I think his statement that it is a day that will live, indeed has lived in infamy, is particularly uh, apposite. Um, we are talking about the attack on Pearl Harbor today, one of the most famous, notorious um, military operations of the Second World War, certainly, probably of military history more generally as well, certainly in kind of uh, the 20th century. Um, it's considered a Japanese uh, tactical uh, victory, but perhaps a strategic failure, um, I think is the common wisdom when discussing the attack on Pearl Harbor. It wasn't necessarily realized at the time. If I may interject with a quote by uh, by the Admiral Admiral Hara, also nicknamed King Kong for his size by his friends, uh, he said, "We won a great tactical victory at Pearl Harbor and thereby lost the war." Mm. Yes, when I was reading the article, what struck me was this quote that I've known for a long time but I've never been able to source it. I'm not sure exactly where it comes from um, but the quote is something along the lines of um, uh, I'm paraphrasing quite heavily here but something like soldiers uh, soldiers worry about um, tactics and generals worry about logistics or something like that. Um, the, the gist of the quote is that logistics is far more important to a war effort than any individual operation ever could be. And to that end, the failure of the Japanese military to really knock out the logistical capability uh, of Pearl Harbor to conduct repairs and salvage operations um, guaranteed its overall strategic failure to the war effort. Um, there was a, 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 a belief in the upper echelons of the Japanese military, um, especially the Imperial Japanese Navy, the IJN, that battleships were kind of king, and <clears throat> therefore the primary objective of the attack on Pearl Harbor for the Japanese was to cripple and sink as many US battleships as possible. And although that was reasonably successful, um, all of them, all of the ships uh, damaged or destroyed, except three, were eventually repaired and put back to the sea. So even the success of the tactical victory was is kind of um, limited in 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 its time scale. Um, that was kind of the 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 main thing that I took away from from this article. Um, but obviously, it's situated within the context of 
the entire Second World War, which is no small subject to discuss. Um, what angle would you take if you had to educate someone about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Uh, what I find interesting about the attack on Pearl Harbor is, uh, well, for reasons, for the same reasons uh, that it was later judged in the Tokyo trials to be a war crime, that this attack happened before any declaration of war and without any explicit warning from the Japanese to the Americans. In fact, the United States was not engaged in the World War at the time that Pearl Harbor was attacked. So it's really quite a significant turning point in the war that did not land in Japan's favour, because I think most people know how World War Two ends. Mm. I think the conventional wisdom has evolved somewhat around the, Jap the Japanese intention or lack thereof to declare war on the United States before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, indeed, there's a whole subsection of the article that discusses it. It's quite a complex business. The best I understood it was that um, the senior members of the Japanese hierarchy never really intended to declare war formally. That's kind of the, the most recent um, conventional wisdom with the discovery of uh, documents by one uh, Takeo Iguchi at International Christian University Tokyo in 1999 um, that said, for example, quote, our deceptive diplomacy is steadily proceeding towards success. Um, nevertheless, it seems like uh, Admiral Yamamoto, who was uh, in charge of uh, the operation at Pearl Harbor, um, ha believed or at least intended to w wait uh, in launching his attack until this final document, the 14-part message, a kind of 5,000-word essay um, uh, to the uh, could be transmitted to the Japanese embassy in Washington. Um, however, the message itself has two caveats to it. Firstly, it doesn't actually declare war formally. It says that uh, something along the lines of negotiations will no longer work. Uh, let's see, it says, uh, quote, um, the Japanese government regrets to have to notify hereby the American government that in view of the attitude of the American government, it cannot but consider that it is impossible to reach an agreement through further negotiations. So it sort of formally broke off negotiations between the two countries, but never actually declared war, regardless of whether the Admiral thought it did. And in any case, it's a moot point, because the message was so long that it could not be transcribed or transmitted in time, which meant that it was only delivered after the attack on Pearl Harbor anyway. Uh, therefore, formally, legally, it was a, 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 an attack made outside of wartime, and therefore everyone present, all the casualties, <clears throat> are legally, or were legally non-combatants, even though they were military personnel. Outside of a formal declaration of war, the US was, uh, was not yet fighting against the Nazis in Europe. So this, uh, <laughs> this provocation, this act of war, uh, not only led to the US turning its guns on Japan, but also in finally intervening uh, with the Allies in Europe to push back against Germany, um, well, and Italy. Um, I was also interested in the background to the conflict um, but also what happened after it. So it's not just the event itself. It's interesting. It's where it's situated in history. Because uh, from 1937, Japan had uh, expanded into China 
causing the Second Sino-Japanese War, uh, they had quite uh, a an imperialist, in the more traditional sense, policy of expand and conquer in order to get access to resources. So, um, they had done a number of things from 1937, which led to some deterioration in their relationship with the US anyway, but even before Pearl Harbor. Um, for example, one event that is mentioned is the USS Panay, Panay incident. Um, it was a Japanese bombing attack on a Navy river gu gunboat uh, on the Yangtze River. Um, and I believe those boats were attempting to uh, rescue Chinese and US civilians who were fleeing the attack on the capital of the Republic of China. So, yeah, that that did not make the US very happy. Um, the other two incidents mentioned in the background here are the Allison incident and the Nanking uh, or Nanjing massacre. Uh, the Allison incident occurred within the, the Nanjing massacre, I believe. I believe it was named after John Moore Allison, who was a diplomat, and he got uh, struck in the face with a gun or something. I'm not quite sure. He got, he was a victim of some violence uh, as but a part of a massacre in the capital of China by the Japanese. Um, and as it's put here in the article, Attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, this event swung Western public opinion sharply against Japan. Not a good look to be doing genocide. Um, Britain was already always very aligned with the US in terms of these is issues, as far as I can see. Um, in part, you can see that they jointly proposed action to blockade Japan after the massacre, but that was an unsuccessful proposal in the end. Um, but in 1938, the, the US stopped uh, providing Japan with implements of war. Um, those are just the, I mean, this all comes from like two, two, three sentences in the article, but I found them particularly interesting in terms of other historical events that were deteriorating Japan and the US's relations. Mm. Do you have any comment? Yeah, I think you've, you've touched on a lot there. Um, the overall point that something as famous as the attack on Pearl Harbor often overshadows the context in which it's situated. And I think it is very important to be able to look at the events that led to the attack on Pearl Harbor and the events that the attack on Pearl Harbor itself then led to um, in order to get a more complete understanding of the incident itself. Because although it, it, it was a, a kind of surprise attack, um, it's not true to say that relations between Japan and the US were cordial or, or happy um, before the 7th of December 1941. Um, they have been deteriorating for, for some time uh, because of uh, the incidents that you uh, mentioned, among uh, other things, more kind of not necessarily mundane, but less um, uh, meteoric. Uh, events like just kind of standard back and forth through trade, dependence on resources, especially oil, um, the behavior of Japan towards its neighbors, the international, um, no, not formal agreements, but understandings of powerful countries' sphere of influences. There was uh, very early on in the, um, the treaty, a treaty of, um, Versailles, um, I want to say a Paris Treaty, the Japanese pr proposal um, of 
uh, racial equality. Um, oh yes, I found that very interesting section yes, as well. Yes, where the, 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 the Japanese um, proposed a clause endorsing racial equality. It was originally intended to mean four League of Nations states only. It then got expanded. Uh, it doesn't elaborate how, but through some diplomatic mechanism to be racial equality for everyone, all humans. And this proposal was rejected or defeated, um, particularly by Australia, apparently, which is a little bit uh, disappointing. Um, but this alienated Japan from a lot of the Western powers diplomatically, um, as, a, as an example of an early incident. Um, I would also say, when you mentioned the conflict between the US and Germany and Italy in uh, the Second World War. That's quite a quite a famous example of a, uh, a failure of, of uh, politicking on uh, the Third Reich's part um, because the uh, other tripartite countries, uh, signatories, Germany and Italy, had no obligation <laughs> to uh, declare war on the US just because Japan had um, but they decided to anyway um, and this uh, directly and immediately led to the US declaring war back on them and their involvement um, formal military engagement um, with the European theatres um, which I, th I think it's commonly agreed sealed the fate of um, uh, Hitler and Mussolini's uh, regimes, if it wasn't already. The involvement of the US was decisive. Um, so yes, there's, there's a lot of context that defines the attack on Pearl Harbor beyond, um, uh, uh, beyond the incident itself. However, that said, for me, what I found most engaging about the article was actually these tiny little details and characters who contributed quite a lot, but whose names and um, uh, roles in the event have been not lost to history, of course, but sort of um, overshadowed by the the maps and the the descriptions and numbers of forces and troop movements and casualty lists and that sort of thing. Um, in particular, the, the uh, there was a uh, a Japanese spy called Takeo Yoshikawa um, who lived uh, on the island at the time um, in Hawaii and fed uh, critical and crucial information um, about the composition and deployment of uh, the U.S. Pacific Fleet um, to the uh, IJN uh, before the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, and his just just reading his biography as as someone who um, graduated from the Naval Academy and uh, and then wanted to be a naval pilot but had some sort of it says quote severe stomach ailment. That prevented him from completing his training and he briefly contemplated suicide um, obviously changed his mind instead recruited in naval intelligence through naval intelligence he uh, kind of learned English and was deployed to the US eventually found himself on um, Hawaii fed information to the IJN contributed to the attack on Pearl Harbor this kind of little microcosm of chaos theory right of all of these individuals um, and and this this man uh, Takeo is uh, is just one example of so many um, involved on that day, um, and and it's true of any any incident like this, be it a, a military battle or a, a natural disaster response or a, a conference, a big international conference gathering, anything like that. I always find these these individual threads that weave through the larger narrative particularly fascinating for myself yes uh, yeah it's always interesting to hear about particular individuals and their involvement um, especially when it 
runs so deep to enabling the grand historical events that unfolded. Um, I've got a couple of characters that I um, am somewhat intrigued by who you could say did not manage to have a major impact, but I still find them interesting anyway. Um, the first of which I'll mention is Admiral James Richardson. Um, says in this article that Admiral James Richardson was removed from command shortly after he protested uh, a decision by then US President Roosevelt. And that decision um, was to move the bulk of the Pacific Fleet to Pearl Harbor. And the reason Admiral James Richardson had even protested that was because in 1932 and in 1936, there were two naval war games that demonstrated Pearl Harbor was vulnerable. Uh, and it was vulnerable to the exact kind of attack that was then to happen only five years after that second war game. Um, so, in fact, that those war games and that knowledge has led to some conspiracy theories um, around like how is it all that military and political leadership could ignore warnings that led to such a catastrophic thing happening um, although that's not the view of mainstream historians hence it's a cons set of conspiracy theories um, but yeah just interesting to see that there were people that were concerned about this sort of thing happening. Um, maybe things would have been different, but then things could have been different in so many ways. What if the US, if the US had not been dragged into the war by Japan, what would have happened? What would have happened in China? What would have happened in Europe? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, should, yeah. I, let's perhaps I, I feel like we've been circling the attack itself quite a bit um, perhaps it would be useful to, to quickly uh, dive into the actual events of the day um, because it didn't well I say the day but it didn't, didn't last very long at all I think it only lasted about an hour and a half two hours um, and we've discussed kind of the context around it and the aftermath and the battle plan and that sort of thing and I'm sure most people know what the attack on Pearl Harbor was um, but just to give uh, an idea of the kind of figures involved um, the uh, uh, once the once the attack was um, approved um, the striking force which was the name the Japanese gave to the um, task force that uh, would uh, attack Pearl Harbor um, dispatched uh, six aircraft carriers and its support um, carrying a total of 408 aircraft um, to uh, cripple US naval not even supremacy really but um, capability in the Pacific Ocean and the Japanese saw this not as um, uh, although they obviously knew this would lead to war with the US although they had kind of hoped that it would lead to forceful negotiations instead, um, the intention was not so much to attack the United States per se. Um, obviously, that was the goal of the operation. But what the Japanese really cared about were other territories um, in the Pacific that they felt would be sort of too well protected if the US um, Pacific fleet were allowed to remain unhindered. And so the striking force uh, departed on the 26th of November, eventually launched its attack in the early hours of the morning, local time, on the uh, 7th of December, um, in two waves. Planes were dispatched from the Japanese aircraft carriers to uh, basically bomb the hell out of the ships, priority the battleships, but also the smaller vessels and the airfields <clears throat> on the island in Hawaii, uh, which, if left 
unhindered would be able to launch aircraft to uh, fight back. Um, all of these objectives were achieved with very minimal casualties for the Japanese personnel involved. Um, however, the second air attack, the second wave, um, faced stiff resistance, all things considered, from an unprepared um, group of defenders. Um, and so the decision was taken to not launch a third wave, um, uh, which some historians have argued was the plan um, initially to launch a third wave. Um, but given that American anti-aircraft performance improved considerably during the second strike. Two thirds of what little losses, uh, the Japanese did suffer at Pearl Harbor were during that second wave. So that means they lost twice the number of, um, aircraft and personnel as they had in the first wave. Also given that, <clears throat> um, it was risking a lot to attack smaller vessels or logistical bases, um, when you consider the, the the value of the aircraft carriers committing to the assault, and also given that the Japanese naval doctrine at the time was to conserve forces over total destruction of the enemy, the decision was taken to withdraw after two strikes. I think as we were talking about at the beginning, um, this was from a strictly a moral strategic perspective of a Japanese military planner, completely the wrong decision and a third attack um, that did attack logistical capabilities at Pearl Harbor would have uh, quote uh, uh, withdrawn the US from the Pacific uh, would have pos postponed US naval operations in the Pacific for more than a year um, nevertheless this kind of third um, nebulous possible third strike uh, never manifested um, and Finally, as a, as a uh, little bit of information on the losses suffered, um, the US had about three and a half thousand casualties in total, um, of whom 2,335 killed, 1,143 wounded. Um, so a really high um, death rate, fatality rate specifically. But almost half of those came from one ship, the battleship uh, USS Arizona, which um, got unlucky and a, uh, I think it's ammunition dump or um, fuel dump or something explosive was triggered, which blew up uh, the whole ship and killed almost everyone on board. And it's now a war memorial. Still, the wreckage is still at the bottom of Pearl Harbor, I believe. And to this day, it still occasionally leaks tiny bits of fuel oil into the water, um, kind of 70 years later. Um, and because of the events of that day, that's what led to uh, the surrounding context that uh, that we've been um, discussing. Did you have um, anything that I, you, you think I've missed there? on the, the day itself that you wanted to um, um, add in? I'm just trying to remember what did the US have any aircraft carriers there at that at Pearl Harbor and what no. was the outcome of them? No they didn't No. No, so the um, the three US uh, 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 aircraft carriers um, that were available at the time were the, let's have a quick check, uh, yes, here we go, um, the, all three of the US Pacific Fleet's aircraft carriers, the Enterprise, the Lexington, and the Saratoga, um, were absent from Pearl Harbor at the time, and the IJN didn't actually know where they were. And this may also have contributed to the rather speedy retreat afterwards mm. um, because they yes. were concerned about these um, aircraft carriers. And it was lucky that they weren't present and caught off guard because they were one of the chief lessons of the Second World War in particular was the supremacy of the aircraft carrier over the battleship um, for naval 
well, for any operations involving boats. Um, well, that leads me on to something then. Um, yes, they uh, probably should have been concerned about the location of those aircraft carriers, even if they weren't there to take out their own ships. Because I recall reading on this page that uh, Japan had this idea that the relevance of the Navy in terms of the broader conflict was that they needed to hoard battleships for some big battleship fight on the Pacific. But that never happened, and they still lost. Hmm. Wasn't the wasn't the the famous battle of Midway kind of the big the big fight? But it wasn't so much a battleship fight as an aircraft carrier fight that the IJN decisively lost and uh, established U.S. naval supremacy in the Pacific for the rest of the war. Yeah. So the the use of their battleships was um, not as big of a deal as they thought it was going to be. Perhaps. Um, we have, I think, just over kind of five to ten minutes left. Um, I would be quite keen to get your opinion on what might be considered the um, Allies' darkest consequence of Pearl Harbor, in that because of deteriorating US-Japanese relations that culminated in this strike, um, Pearl Harbor catalyzed an executive order from President Roosevelt to forcibly relocate and incarcerate approximately 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry, almost all of them um, American citizens, in concentration camps in uh, the western interior of the US to kind of remove these Japanese Americans, or indeed just anyone of Japanese ancestry, um, away from the West Coast f- and bring them further inland and kind of imprison them in, in these concentration camps. Um, Canada also, although on a much smaller scale, um, enabled uh, this sort of policy in uh, the aftermath of, of Pearl Harbor as well. But I think the US... Uh, internment of Japanese Americans is is kind of the more famous one. Um, I don't know much about this side of history. I think it's often lost or masked by the grandeur of you know military engagements and intergovernment conflict and the Second World War as a as a good versus evil yes. sort of thing, but actually, this is this is quite this is quite poor for the US, isn't it? Yes. This is not a good. Well, look. exactly. I think that the grand narrative, good versus evil, particularly, like obviously, it comes up um, for a lot of conflict. Many people will get the impression that sort of links back to our episode on villains, you know, if you you side against someone and you have a tendency to assume the worst in their moral character. Um, I think it's probably more helpful in terms of learning from history to look at why a group of people were bad rather than simply calling them bad because they are part of that group. Mm. For example, um, although I like, I wouldn't necessarily say it's unfair to say that the axis of Germany, Japan, Italy, I'd probably say they were the bad guys of world war two. I think that's pretty fair as a fair assessment. (laughs) Um, but that does not mean that, um, that they were the only people doing bad things Mm. no I mean we already have very interesting mention of that uh, equality act being shut down Mm. Uh, being shut down by what we know as the good guys from World War 2 and now you mention this internment of um, of the Japanese within allied nations yeah um, 
there were lots of mistakes and there were I guess I don't know if it might be unfair to call them mistakes in the sense that these were deliberately done and now I think most people can accept that they were not good things they were not morally good things to do yeah. and immoral th- actions were taken from both sides however there were some sides that started an international conflict and their actions very much led to escalation yeah. for example attacking <laughs> ships from a country you're not at war with is a surefire way to justify war from that country uh, and that led to really quite a turn in the uh, influence and power of Japan in the world see they, they they got into this into this mess I suppose by being imperialist wanting to attack people to improve their influence and standing but I mean if you accidentally kick the hornet's nest then you're not going to end up in a stronger position than you were before they were attacking China, they were attacking America, and it ended with them being pushed back. Uh, and unfortunately, with the detonation of two nuclear weapons uh, within their borders. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I think it would be fair to put a lot of the blame uh, on the governance of Japan for the outcomes that they sustained hmm. yeah for sure um, it's a good example I think of how international and domestic policy I'm a, a bit of a I'm a politics student formally so indulge me but I think this is a good example of how uh, foreign and domestic policy um, interact with each other and interlock with each other. Um, They're often considered two entirely separate realms, um, uh, with maybe the exception of something like trade. Um, But actually, the war with Japan uh, started in 1941 for the US um, led to this enormous domestic... Uh, well, uh, I think they called it an evacuation program uh, at the time. Actually, I think they would, they would, they would. Um, I don't know if that's just an older use of the term, as in relocating by evacuation. Um, but this this removal of over a hundred thousand people um, to other parts of the country, some in military run camps, some in civilian run camps. Um, some people, I think overwhelmingly, I think the American public supported it. Um, there were some groups that, that opposed it, but all of this coming from, uh, did, uh, nothing domestic, but from, uh, war, from, from, in, in, in the most abstract sense, foreign relations. Um, I think it's one of my go-to examples because people often, at least in my experience, um, think of countries fighting each other as black boxes, uh, which is to say it doesn't particularly matter what goes on inside the countries. It's understood that the whole country kind of unites, comes together, focuses, pours resources, works as one, and anything that the country does, it does in lockstep with itself. Whereas, yeah. whereas in reality, that's, that's a convenient way, a kind of shorthand way of, um, analyzing, um, states' actions. But in reality, as, as this demonstrates, is not necessarily or even usually true when you start to look uh, a little bit deeper. And sometimes that's for better, and sometimes that's for worse. I, w- I wouldn't even say it's usually true in the case of uh, democracies that if a state 
performs an action, it's reasonable to assume that that is an action of, say, the British public when the British government does something. <laughs> but in the case of, um, well, the the state of war back then, uh, I mean, we're not even really talking about democracies anymore, though. These big decision-making bodies. Japan was an imperial system, and the, the decision to attack Pearl Harbor was made by an emperor. So to take that decision and use it to justify um, extreme prejudice <laughs> against Japanese people within your own country uh, is really quite morally abhorrent. <laughs> hmm. And indeed, on the 10th of August 1988, President Ronald Reagan signed the Civil, Liberty, Civil Liberties Act of 1988, um, which uh, ensured that every former internee who was still alive when the act was passed uh, received financial reparations totaling, at the time, uh, just for inflation, uh, 20,000 US dollars. Um, and then on uh, the 27th of September 1992, the Civil Liberties Act amendments um, allocated an additional $400 million to ensure that anyone who had fallen through the cracks or, um, uh, or not claimed anything like that was able to receive the uh, redressment payment, which was under uh, George H.W. Bush. And uh, President H.W. Bush also issued a second formal apo uh, formal apology from the U.S. government, and <clears throat> he actually issued this on the seventh of December, nineteen ninety one. So the fiftieth anniversary um, of the uh, Pearl Harbor attack, and I think maybe the the quote that he said might be a nice way to kind of close this. Um, he said, "In remembering, it is important to come to grips with the past. No nation can fully understand itself." or find its place in the world if it does not look with clear eyes at all the glories and disgraces of its past. We in the United States acknowledge such an injustice in our history. The internment of Americans of Japanese ancestry was a great injustice, and it will never be repeated. So, uh, we, can only, uh, we can only hope that this is true going forward, because... Uh, there's a lot of future to deal with. <laughs>